Okay, so um, welcome everyone to uh, today's SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies um, online uh, book launch. Today we're doing the book launch of Democracy and Rule of Law um, in China's Shadow, a book that's edited by uh, Brian Christopher uh, Jones. We're really delighted to welcome um, uh, Brian back. He was last here um, in December of 2017. Um, and just, I was just chatting to to um, uh, my students um, uh, beforehand. And I noticed I've got the um, I've still got the poster, oh. the 20, December twenty seventeen um, uh, book talk, which I think Brian you did on your own, didn't you? I think um, yes, that's right. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but this time we're even more lucky. We're actually um, uh, joined by two of the uh, the chapter authors, and that was part of the both based in Taiwan. That was part of the reason why we decided. To do today's session as a um, online um, uh, launch, uh, Brian is now a, a lecturer at, uh, in law at the University of uh, Sheffield. Um, Brian's travelled quite a bit in his academic um, uh, career. He's had a postdoc in Academia Sinica, and in his last talk in uh, 2017, um, he was based in in Dundee. So now he's come halfway down. Um, uh, to uh, towards uh, London, um, but as I mentioned earlier, we have two um, uh, chapter authors as well uh, joining us. Um, uh, firstly, we have uh, Jimmy Xu uh, from um, who has positions in both Academia Sinica and um, uh, National Yangming Jiao Tong uh, University, and Jimmy is going to speak in um, at SOAS for the first time. So we're really delighted to. Uh, to hear about uh, Jimmy's uh, research um, on a topic that I, I think is really kind of um, um, uh, relevant to our students because we have so much interest in um, Taiwanese uh, social movements. Um, but I don't think we, we've um, had enough legal angles on this. That's one of the reasons why I'm really delighted that um, Brian's brought um, um, you all uh, together. And then our third speaker, is Professor Guan Xiaowei from um, uh, the College of Law, National Taipei uh, University. Um, like uh, like Brian, uh, Xiaowei is someone who's um, uh, we're familiar with because she was uh, here even more recently. She spoke at our summer school back in um, 2020 uh, when she spoke about the really fascinating topic about the feminist movement and the decriminal decriminalization of adultery, a really topical issue that just um, 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 we've just seen that constitutional ruling back earlier in, in 2020. And like many of our speakers at SOAS, uh, Professor Guan is someone who combines both academic work on legal issues related to, to gender, but also someone who's quite heavily involved in activism, um, in the promotion of gender um, equality. Um, in Taiwan. And I think this is one of the reasons why our students really enjoy uh, hearing um, uh, sp people speak at SOAS who combine both the academic uh, and uh, activist um, um, angles on uh, Taiwanese politics and society. So welcome all three of you. And let me then first hand over to Brian to talk a little bit about the, um, the overall project and how it came to uh, uh, fruition, something that is often, as someone who's edited books, I know uh, how complex and how frustrating uh, that can be. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and welcome to SOAS. Uh, thanks so much, um, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation, David. And uh, thanks also to the the other speakers for being here, uh, for uh, Xiaowei and Jimmy. It's really nice to see you guys, uh, even if it's only virtually. I'm really pleased to be back at SOAS at the Center of Taiwan Studies. And I think you guys, you know, do so much uh, down there. And it's, you know, really nice to be included in the program. Um, so as Daph had said, uh, rather than delving into my chapter, uh, which is on court criticism and the rule of law, I'm just going to provide some kind of general comments and uh, reflections on the book. Um, and let me start off by saying, um, I think publication of the book to me feels a little bit bittersweet. Um, so 
And I'm really proud of the book uh, that we put out. Um, and I think in a large sense, it's kind of a follow up of uh, our previous collections, so, which was called Law and Politics of the Taiwan Sunflower and a Hong Kong Umbrella Movements. So we have we cover some of these developments um, and some of the kind of uh, things related to what happened uh, in those movements. Uh, but we definitely go beyond them as well in this text. Um, I think we have some really, you know, insightful chapters from a wide variety of authors. And I think we have both, you know, well-established and early career authors and a lot of authors, you know, from that middle range as well. Um, we have authors from the UK, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore and Australia. So I think it's truly, you know, a collaborative project. And it was great to work with these authors. Um, and the process was definitely, you know, so much easier because of them. So, you know, thank you, uh, Wei and Jimmy, uh, for making things so much easier. Um, I think the book also has some brave chapters um, that I think say kind of new and fresh things uh, and maybe some things that people are a little bit kind of hesitant to say um, as well. Um, so I'm really proud of that um, also. Um, also, the book is definitely, you know, has a personal dimension to it also. So, you know, my wife is Taiwanese and I have two children that are Taiwanese, not to mention many friends and family in Taiwan and Hong Kong and other places in Asia as well. Uh, so many of the issues, you know, that we talk in the book definitely hit home um, and they impact people that I know and love. So it's definitely, you know, a highly personal project as well. Um, and I think it's also you know, evident that these issues stretch beyond Asia and definitely beyond China's shadow. And I think that's readily apparent from some of the chapters in the book as well. So, you know, those are a few things that I'm I'm really happy and, and proud that, you know, that we did in the book. Um, but it, the reason it's kind of bittersweet um, is because let me also say that the, the optimism that I had, I think, when we started the project has kind of dwindled a little bit. Um, so, you know, we used to talk about kind of interesting legal and political changes in Taiwan, um, you know, from just a few years back, you know, same sex marriage and kind of some of these new uh, political developments. And now we hear, you know, increasingly less about these interesting, you know, legal and political developments and more about kind of the fractious relationship between Taiwan and China. And of course, China's desire to kind of swallow or unify Taiwan as well. Um, we also um, heard uh, or at least saw kind of this, you know, resurgence of interest in democracy in Hong Kong. And I think you probably saw that from about 2014 to 2019, right, which was a really intense period in Hong Kong. Um, really kind of a lot of interest in the basic law, you know, what the basic law said about democracy, how democracy was going to be delivered. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, what was genuine democracy and how was genuine uh, democracy going to be delivered. And, you know, some of that, I think, is definitely dwindled, right? You know, it was extremely difficult to finish up the book uh, when so much change was happening in Hong Kong and on the Hong Kong side, um, especially with the new national security law and the clampdown uh, on free speech in Hong Kong. So I think it was really difficult to say, you know, when we just had to stop and say, you know, yes, there are still developments going on, but we just have to stop and, you know, get this, this book out and published. Um, so it was very difficult to know kind of when to do that. And I think, you know, let's not forget that, you know, a lot of the things that we're discussing here, I think, you know, uh, are quite serious. You know, we have one author in the collection, uh, Benny Tai, um, that's lost his job and is currently imprisoned. Um, and for what? Right. For for advocating democracy, um, essentially. Um, just a couple of days ago as well, we saw that Tony Chung become the young, became the youngest person to be jailed under Hong Kong's national security law at 20 years old. Um, he was sentenced to two years and seven months uh, for secession. And the district judge um, even said, even though the defendant did not have concrete plans to split the country, his goal was very much clear. The charge of secession does not require actual plans. Um, so you can see how seriously Hong Kong is treating um, speech uh, at the moment and especially things like, 
you know, acknowledging independence or formally acknowledging that you want independence for Hong Kong. It's almost akin to kind of the way that Western countries would treat something like terrorism. Um, but um, also, you know, not for this event, but, you know, for other events, I've approached authors uh, of this uh, within this collection to talk about their chapters. And, you know, they've been unwilling to do so and they're afraid to do so. Um, so I think that also shows kind of where we are um, in this discussion in relation to kind of speech and how it's developing um, in East Asia. Um, so the things that we're writing about, the things that we're reading about can sometimes seem, you know, really abstract. Uh, but there are people who, you know, are living these developments and have to deal with these developments on a daily basis. And I think that should not be forgotten as well. Um, so let me end with kind of two observations. Um, the first is that for me, at least, uh, Taiwan, and you could even say, you know, Hong Kong from kind of 24 to 2019, uh, to me is a reminder that, you know, not everything has to be about economics, right? You know, I think sometimes we lose sight of this. And it, I think especially when it comes to constitutional issues. Um, of course, economic considerations are relevant. You know, there's no doubt about that. But governmental arrangements, you know, how things are structured, how democracy operates in a particular state can be just as important, if not more so than economic benefits. Right. And this, of course, began with that kind of scuppered trade pact in 2014 in Taiwan. They would definitely have have benefited Taiwan, you know, economically. Um, so sometimes, you know, I think this shows that countries do have to make difficult decisions about things. They could hurt their GDP, right? But in the long run could maybe be more valuable. And I think that's a valuable lesson, um, not just in Asia um, or in, you know, China's shadow, but I think even beyond um, as well, right? You know, I think that kind of differentiates Taiwan from some of its neighbors, right? Who may be really good at kind of the economic bit, right? And really good at, you know, keeping citizens happy and content um, with all the stuff, you know, that they provide and all the convenience that they provide. But these countries aren't so good at, you know, state structure and governmental arrangement and providing, you know, a plethora of rights and citizen, right, rights and liberties to their citizens as well. So I think Taiwan definitely shines uh, when it comes to stuff like that. And I think the second major thing uh, that this shows is the importance of free speech, um, which is another thing that I think differentiates Taiwan from many of its neighbors. And there's three things I want to highlight here in regards to that. So first, you know, free speech allows for unencumbered dialogue to take place amongst citizens, right? And also not just amongst citizens, but, but between citizens and the state as well, right? So being able to freely engage with your fellow citizens and to search for that ultimate truth on various issues and problems that society faces. Um, and also for the elected branches, right? And especially the government to know what is important and relevant to the people and to be able to respond to those requests from the people, right? And if democracy is about paying attention to, paying attention to citizens, then knowing what they want is, you know, key there, right? Secondly, free speech allows for people to know their true history, right? Beyond what the state is telling them is their true history, right? Beyond what is known in kind of these official documents, you know, such as constitutions or other things. Um, the state may have one version of history, but free speech allows societies to have more than that official version, right? And that's inherently valuable. And I think something that, you know, Taiwan's neighbors probably miss out on. And finally, uh, free speech allows for people um, and citizens to recognize and reflect on kind of constitutional mistakes, right? Mistakes exist, of course, in every regime, but free speech at least allows for the recognition and acknowledgement of those mistakes, right? And therefore, the opportunity to put them right or to not make them again, right? And I think that also differentiates um, Taiwan uh, from some of its neighbors. Um, and so those are some kind of reflections um, on the book and kind of how it came together and some of kind of the important uh, themes uh, that I think it was trying to weave together. Uh, but I'd like to stop there uh, and give uh, Xiaowei and Jimmy uh, the floor. So thanks very much.
So I, I really appreciate uh, being part of this project. And actually, um, last year, after I finished uh, co-authoring this chapter with Anne Zhang uh, of University of Hong Kong, um, I, I, I delved deeper into, into Taiwan's court decisions, I actually surveyed uh, uh, the whole decade that came before uh, the Sunflower Movement. And uh, I think there are very interesting things to observe uh, by seeing how the court developed uh, uh, into, into uh, uh, develop all the models that uh, help it uh, cope with uh, civil disobedience and culminating in Sunflower Movement. And um, so today I will just uh, give you a very, very uh, quick picture of this chapter. This chapter we mean to compare Taiwan and Hong Kong and see how from the law side, from the court side, um, how, do, how do the court evaluate, um, evaluate all these cases, very difficult cases, because civil disobedience by definition, by nature, uh, is, is a kind of case that straddles between the legal system and the political system. And so uh, uh, the next slide, please. Um, uh, Joel, yes, just please go on uh, maybe several slides down. I will skip some of it because I don't have to explain to you all these basics about all these events. Uh, please, next. Next, uh, please uh, go on. Go on until the uh, the next slide. So, uh, okay, so uh, stop here. So I will tell you that the most interesting thing is that how do we compare the two societies? What are we comparing? So we have these court decisions before before us, and um, their 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 um, the conclusions are very different, and there are some similarities, but they're different. So I think the most important thing is that we have to find a framework, a theoretical framework that organizes all these, uh, the, the two jurisdictions' uh, court decisions. And uh, But civil disobedience literature is not really uh, offering us much, because most of it is uh, in the political philosophy, political theory, and actually law uh, from how do we deal with civil society from law's perspective, from the court's perspective? There's relatively uh, a, a rare a theoretical framework, so we have to come up with our own. And we found this very interesting book uh, that was actually in the um, the this version, this uh, this version, this edition was uh, issued in 2001, but actually it came out in the 70s, and. Um, and we find the Philip uh, Nonnet and Philip Selson's uh, three models of, of law, politics, and society very interesting. So let me go go through them very quickly. We find these three models uh, very uh, having uh, great explanatory power for us. Um, so the first is repressive law. In, in in the repressive law model, the court is subject to political power. The, basically, the court identifies itself with the state and it identifies itself as one arm of the state okay and in the second model is autonomous law and in autonomous model uh, autonomous law model the court it sees itself as an independent guardian of law that is distinguished that is independent from politics especially from the uh, from the government uh, but uh, it it came as a prize because it has to distance it with itself from political questions. So it draws a very, very clear line. At least it tries to. It tries to, the court tries to draw a very clear line between law and politics. So um, when it comes to more political questions, the, the, the court can seem to be very conservative. But, but that is actually a prize uh, for, for independence because the whole idea of autonomous law is that the court remains independent and remains aloof from political questions and stick to the law. And that is the law is the shelter for, for the court, for it to do its own job. And at times it can use law to check the power of the, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the government. So in this case, um, the court sees itself more as an independent arbiter of, of sociopolitical conflict. And uh, the third model is responsive law. Uh, in this mo under this model, the court sees itself as a social reformer. So it's still, it is still independent from politics. 
but it is more in, uh, willing to engage itself with social transitions. So when there is social movement, um, it, it might just um, uh, try to take sides. You know, just if the court sees, it, it does not distance itself from po more political conflict. So uh, when it, when the time comes, when the court sees itself as, you know, giving a, the last kick, just uh, it, and uh, bring itself uh, together uh, for for the for the uh, for the benefit of social reform. So in this case, the court sees itself uh, as a promotion, a promoter of certain direction of social reform. So next slide, please. So now we have the three models, and um, uh, uh, still next, please. So we we can have a quick look at. Uh, 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 please go on, uh, next slide, uh, go on. Uh, a Hong Kong umbrella movement, uh, no need to uh, talk about the facts, so let's go on to the next slide. Uh, uh, Joe, you can, yes. So the first series uh, of cases is about Wang Jifeng, of course, uh, uh, him as a leader. And what's interesting is that, uh, okay, the, the magistrate court, or the district court, um, he was charged with all these uh, charges, and uh, he was he was found guilty. But he was given actually a not so serious uh, sentencing. But when it came to the court of appeal, because the secretary of justice you know appealed this case, he was not satisfied that the Wang Jifeng and other and others were given such lenient sentence. So at the second level, at the second instance of court, the court of appeal gave it six to eight months, you know, more severe uh, than the magistrate court. And at the same time, the Court of Appeal gave strict guidelines for disorderly assembly and degrees of violence. So um, this is a, a little bit more uh, severe and, um, uh, 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 court decision. Okay, so let's move on to the Court of Final Appeal. The Court of Final, uh, Joel, please move on. Uh, the Court of Final Appeal is the most interesting uh, case in this series. So the Court of Final Appeal um, says that the guideline can stand, but it should not be applicable to the present case. It should be applicable only, only to the future case. And so it reversed the severe sentence of Court of Appeal and upheld the Magistrate Court's that lenient sentence. You can see here that the Court of a fi of a Final Appeal here is treading on a very fine line. At the one hand, it, um, it well, you can see that it, it, it tries to protect Wang Jifeng by, um, by going back uh, to the Magistrate Court's lenient sentencing. But on the other hand, it seems that it cannot withstand uh, the pressure uh, from, from uh, you know, not just from the Court of Appeal, but maybe from the greater environment, that there should be a stricter measures being applied to these protesters in the future. So even, so the, the, the basic idea is that even if we let go, let you go, just uh, let you go with a lenient sentencing, in the future, we're not going to be uh, doing this. Uh, you should be, you should be uh, watching out for yourself. So next slide. Uh, please go on. Yes. Um, so, so as we just mentioned, um, so th here there are some very interesting reasoning in this case, but I think for the sake of time, I won't uh, talk a lot about it. Th so the basic idea is that I think the Court of Final Appeal is is trying to to uh, to wade into a very troubled water, and uh, it. But at, at the end of the day, it has to it has to uh, call it a day and say, okay, so in the future, uh, things will be different. But uh, so far as we can, uh, we are going to try to protect these protesters. So next uh, next slide. So so when we move on to, to Benny Dai's case, um, we can see, as uh, uh, Brian just mentioned, Benny has, uh, has gone to jail uh, for this case. And um, so we, we, we can see that in Benny Dai's case, uh, the courts are actually using the, the stricter guidelines already. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, the next slide. Taiwan situation 
uh, is more interesting. Go on, please. Um, Taiwan's court. Um, actually, uh, you see that uh, for the so sunflower movement has two main parts. The first part is you know the occupation of the legislative, uh, the legislature, and uh, for this part, the Taipei District Court case. Uh, it, the Taipei District Court came up with a very innovative um, a court, a, a decision. So basically, it seized it seized a very interesting um, element in the criminal statute, saying that um, trespassing has to have a, for a trespass to to be established, you have to prove that they do not have the prosecutor have to prove that they do not have a just cause. And the court sees the element of just cause and say, OK, if you bring into all these uh, considerations of civil disobedience, the justification of civil disobedience, um, the theories of civil disobedience, um, all these considerations of their political legitimacy, then it may have a just cause. You know, so the idea is that they, the court is turning the political legitimacy into legal legitimacy whereas in you know uh, it's not necessarily uh, the case that the court uh, can do so you know under the rule of law or should do so but it, it did so anyway so it seems that the court was going out of its way to find them not guilty okay and uh, next slide please so um, we have another series of cases. This series of cases concerns the other part of Sunflower, which is the invasion of the executive yuan, the premier's office. And uh, in, in this case, especially in the Taiwan High Court, the Taiwan High Court says they're guilty. Okay, they found them guilty, but gave them lenient sentence. But the, tr the court seems to be very troubled about um, letting them go because the court says that uh, no one should be privileged by their political viewpoint. You know, and we are not in the position, basically, it says that we are not in the position to invent law. You know, we are enforcers of law and not to invent law. And so uh, we are not in a position to evaluate the, 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 the legitimacy of their causes. Okay, so next slide, please. So to, to, um, to make a... Uh, to make a, uh, just to give you a whole picture. Okay, so the Hong Kong court, uh, according to the, the, the framework that we just mentioned, the Hong Kong court is actually moving from being under a model of autonomous law to more repressive law. And this is tricky because we don't know exactly just how the courts um, are making the move because I have discussed with Anne and just, we discussed just how, um, whether the court was uh, being driven by somehow, you know, political force, invisible political force, you know, into being more repressive, or it's just those judges seeing the political atmosphere, or they they're just just exercising their political um, uh, 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 judgment in seeing that okay, um, Hong Kong should not just in the future. Uh, if we allow this kind of protest to go on, you know, there will be even more severe situation, which we simply don't know uh, whether the court was co coerced into being more repressive or it's out of the court's own, you know, opinion or uh, the court's own uh, readjustment of its own rule. OK, and, and on the Taiwan court side, Taiwan court is more ambivalent. We can see that um, I would say that the Taipei District Court, the the, uh, the first case I talked about is more like re responsive law. It's very willing to take sides. But whereas on the Taiwan, uh, Taiwan High Court, in the second case, the court remained more autonomous. So it seems that Taiwan's courts have been wavering between these two models. And these two models have their uh, upsides and downsides. You know, for the, for the court to remain autonomous, meaning that it distances in, it itself from getting into the political mire, um, it preserves its own independence and it preserves its uh, own role. It maintains its own role as a neutral arbiter, but it cannot um, just just uh, get itself in, get its own uh, hands dirty and take sides. 
and uh, maybe it loses the opportunity to to give a push, give a boost to certain uh, direction of social reform. Whereas on, on the on the uh, re responsive law side, the the Taipei District Court, the, the first decision that we talked about, um, it also has its uh, risks because when the court gets too deeply uh, into the political questions and political evaluations, especially uh, when the court is summoned to evaluate the causes, the political legitimacy of the of the protesters causes it may get itself into very very uh, uh, heated controversy in in the politics and that perhaps to the extent because if you can imagine in the future Taiwan's uh, future civil disobedience what kind of causes will they be all interested in or, or be engaged you'd be concerned about whether it's uh, the nuclear power plant or um, you know uh, uh, the the, the um, in importation of American pork, you know things like that. Are the court ready to adjudicate on the legitimacy of these causes? So the, at the end of the day, the question it, uh, of Taiwan court is that whether uh, it should normalize all these civil disobedience and make them part of the legal system, uh, or just treat the sunflower movement as an exception and leave it at that and try not to normalize it into democratic politics. I think that at the end of the day, that's the, the challenge that Taiwan's courts is facing. OK, so um, I will I will uh, end up here. Thank you very much. OK, um, it's really happy uh, to be back to SOAS. I have uh, the last meeting with the, the SOA student, a uh, very wonderful experience, and we talked, discussed a, a lot about my topic. And today, um, I'm going to talk about the same-sex marriage controversy in Taiwan. Uh, if you look at the table, table of contents of this book, you'll find this title a, a little bit bizarre. Because what does same-sex marriage have anything to do with China or China's influence? But the center, central concern of this chapter is about the development of direct democracy in Taiwan. Um, so let, let me explain this. Okay. First of all, uh, this chapter, I uh, through reading the materials and documents of the debate during the uh, advocacy and legislation stage of the uh, Popular Voting Act, I found that the legislative debate of the popular voting in Taiwan had not discussed or considered the populist manipulation of direct democracy, nor the possibility of hurting minority groups. So I found that under the shadow of China, the debate on popular voting has been strongly associated with uh, the political debate about the issue of unification and independence, that is Tongdu in Taiwan. So you can guess that KMT will do whatever they take to make the popular voting very difficult or impossible. And, but DPP will try very hard to make popular voting equal to popular sovereignty and a possible tool to realize people's will to support independence. So under these backdrops, uh, when popular voting become uh, 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 realized by the enactment of Popular Voting Act, uh, you can see that the first uh, first version of the PVA was very strict. The threshold of the passage was very high. So people usually mark, uh, let me, people usually mark the, uh, the PVA as a popular voting in the birdcage. Uh, the evidence shows that from 2003 to 2018, there were six propositions pr uh, submitted to uh, uh, for the ballot, but only the uh, uh, no one uh, actually none none of them were uh, successfully passed the threshold. 
Uh, after the sunflower movement, uh, when the Taiwan has very high uh, 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 political uh, strength to uh, political reform, the new power party, uh, they vow to reform the problematic representative democracy. That is the, the uh, reason why the sunflower movement uh, took place. So they proposed a bill that lowered the threshold of the PVA to uh, just a simple majority vote and the 25% uh, of the eligible voters as, as opposed to the previous version as 50%. So after the, uh, the revision in 2017, the ballot questions become uh, different, very different from the previous six. Uh, in the previous six ballot questions, most of them are about the two, uh, to, about the relationship between uh, Taiwan and China. So they were more partisan oriented and about the, the uh, unification and the independence. But after the revision of the PVA, the, the ballot question become diversified and more down to uh, people's life and the uh, social issues. So they become less partisan. Um, so seven out of the 16 prop proposition of the last round uh, took place in 2018. Um, seven of them met the threshold. So they passed the threshold and uh, uh, and the government should uh, should uh, do something to um, conform with the re result of the uh, ballot re uh, outcome. So let's then let's talk about uh, move on to uh, the relationship. How the uh, popular voting. Um, has anything to do with the same-sex marriage? Because the in Taiwan um, there are two uh, there are a uh, uh, social movement, same-sex marriage movement, uh, pushing forward to the legislation, and also they uh, they try the litigation approach to uh, achieve their goal. But the anti-same-sex marriage camp. They try very hard using the uh, uh, popular voting as their strategy to uh, uh, achieve their uh, move uh, agenda. So, bef way before the revision of PVA uh, in 2017, the anti same sex camp had already proposed a proposition to oppose the, the same sex marriage bill in 2015. But the, at that time, uh, the, all the propositions uh, submitted should be reviewed by the National Referendum Review Committee. And the committee rejected the proposal saying that the wording of the proposition was too obscure and uh, too vague because right, that, right then there were no uh, same-sex marriage law or nor any same-sex marriage bill passed in the parliament. So what, what was their target? It is an, an empty one. So they rejected the proposal. But um, in this round of, uh, in this round of uh, popular voting campaign, the anti-same-sex marriage camp learned that they, they can quickly collect the signature and um, very fast through the churches, through the uh, uh, the school network, and it they think they showcase it showcase the, the, their ability to um, ability to push forward the anti same sex marriage agenda. So they think their political muscles are strong enough to um, to push forward their agenda by uh, popular voting if the PVA was uh, rev revised. So they, call, they, they began to call themselves the, the silent majority and they began to adopt the popular voting as their movement strategy. So their 
the one of their movement frame, the, the main frame is let marriage and family matters be decided by the people. Uh, um, so they supported the revision of the PVA from 2016 to uh, 17. They assert that the popular voting is the best way to allow people to exercise their sovereignty. Um, and they are so very important and controversial social issues should be decided by the people instead of by the uh, 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 the PV, uh, uh, the political elites. They, they call them uh, political elites. And they also uh, not only they not only oppose the, the, the uh, political elite in the parliament, they also oppose uh, these um, the, the judicial elites in the uh, Supreme Court or the uh, Constitutional Court. So before the Constitutional Court announced that it will review the same sex marriage petition in 2017. The anti-same-sex marriage groups have already expressed their strong opposition. Um, they don't want the judicial elites to decide the, the marriage definition. So they not only contended that the definition of marriage should not be a matter for a constitutional court, but also should not be decided by any judiciary because it lacked democ democratic legitimacy. And they asked the uh, justice to step aside of this uh, this issue and not to side with, with the what they call dominant minority. And they, they think the minority are bullying the oppressed ma majority. So um, as you all know that the, the constitutional court uh, ultimately come up, made up, uh, made a decision uh, we call interpretation number 748. Um, so after, right after the ruling was rendered, the, the, uh, the anti-same-sex group have uh, hold a protest immediately outside of the uh, constitutional court. And right at the press conference, they, uh, they say that the, they are going to initiate uh, 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 popular voting, um, and and the campaign was uh, will be would be launched right after the uh, the announcement. Um, this part of the uh, civil code versus special law debate was a little bit com uh, uh, complicated, but let me try to uh, uh, simplify it to um, just two slides. I would say that the civil code versus special law uh, debate was a very unique feature of Taiwan's same-sex debate. And that is when people talk about, say about civil code, it means, uh, it, it, it means the, the uh, traditional marriage, heterosexual marriage. When people talk about special law, what they really mean is that uh, they can give the same-sex half couple a, civil union or domestic partnership other than the traditional marriage. So when we talked about whether we are going to give the same-sex couple the marriage, um, we say that, uh, do you support civil code minfa or Fa special law? So the other, the other uh, movement frame is that same-sex couples shall be protected by enacting a special law. So uh, in the anti-same-sex uh, marriage camp, what they really meant that the special law was that we don't want to give you uh, marriage. We want to keep traditional marriage to, to heterosexual couples, but you can get some kind of uh, union or, or partnership, but don't uh, change the definition of uh, the traditional marriage. But uh, after this slogan was proposed, no special law uh, was ever proposed. 
that means special law was just an empty word. There was no content of any kind. They they didn't want to talk about uh, whether a uh, civil union is better or uh, a domestic partnership is better for uh, the protection of the same-sex couples. They just express their their uh, opinion that don't touch traditional marriage. So I tried to um, I tried to um, make this chart to explain uh, the uh, civil code versus special law um, debate. And you can see that actually, if you even if you say that uh, we use special law to protect same sex couple, it is still possible to give them marriage, not just alternatives. But if you, uh, but when you say I want to protect same sex couple using civil code, it doesn't mean that they they can be protected by. Uh, marriage, they can also uh, be be uh, say, provided by alternatives in civil code. So there were A, B, C, D positions, four possible positions. But when people talked about civil code versus special law code, uh, uh, special law, what the anti-same-sex marriage camp means is the position D. That is the uh, special law with alternatives. The form of the relationship is alternatives. But when they, when people think about civil code or special law, they could possibly think about A, B, C, D. So when I support special law, it, it could be I supporting same-sex marriage given by special law or alternatives given by, by special law. So there, it, it is very complicated for people to, to understand what civil code versus special law mean. So the anti-same-sex camp, they use this confusion and design a uh, two proposition, proposition saying the first one, do you agree that marriage, uh, the original proposition was uh, the uh, the sentence without the underlying words. So uh, at first they, they, they come up with this proposition 10. Do you agree that marriage should be restricted to the union between a man and woman? That is the definition of marriage. And the original one, uh, original proposition 12 is the, do you agree with protecting same-sex couples rights of permanent cap cohabitation without the underlying words. But the government said, when you propose the, pop, uh, the Bella question, you cannot do it uh, violating what the constitutional court has already rendered. It means you should protect equal marriage, uh, uh, the right to equal marriage for same-sex couples. So the anti-same-sex marriage camp uh, add, add the underlying words. So it means, do you agree that marriage as defined in the civil code should be restricted to the union between a man and a woman? That means in this one, you have to strike out possib uh, the position A as possibility and it left B, C, D for people to choose. That is the, the, the first one's, uh, the meaning behind the first proposition 10. And together with pros proposition 12, when the underlying wording was added, it means that B, C, D should be, if the proposition 12 was passed, it should be restricted to proposition to position C. It means proposition 12 means that you, you should protect same-sex couples by special law. So the, the answer can be C or D. So the but 
but when the when the anti same sex couple uh, uh, doing their campaign, they keep going to tell people that we are supporting the position D. But actually, position D is a violation of interpretation number 748. That cannot be possible. And they, uh, they, re they know that, so they change the wording and added the underlying wording to this. So I would call this the uh, um, populist uh, uh, design for voters' confusion. Uh, our voters didn't really know what they are voting. <laughs> so when when the outcome uh, uh, it it the outcome is that uh, seven point seven million people vote yes to the proposition ten, and six point four million yes yes vote yes to the proposition twelve, but then what? How to uh, the parliament enact a law that conforms both the interpretation number 748 and the resolved of the population votes? Then proposition C is the only possibility. So our parliament passed a special law to protect same-sex marriage. Uh, so they uh, conform to um, to demands at the same time. So the 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 DDP whip in the parliament, they, he said on um, uh, during the review, they, he said, even a person like me who object uh, object the same sex marriage must face the authority of the constitution. He said that justice interpreted the constitution and demanded that we enact a law to allow same-sex couples to marry. Do we legislators have any room to negotiate and com compromise otherwise? But I will argue that what if uh, the structure of the parliament and also the uh, uh, ruling party is um, uh, the political structure are uh, very different from the what we have at that time. Will they conform with the uh, will they conform with interpretation number seven forty eight, which is the, the decision of the constitutional court, and uh, the constitution said that we should protect people's rights to uh, equal marriage. Uh, so how about next time? So I would say this time we have a safe result, but we don't know what will happen uh, next time when and uh, during the voting, uh, a popular voting process, um, the populist manipulation again and again was um, uh, repeated. So I like to quote uh, Ko Jianming's uh, this, this statement. He said that we need to bow to the constitution. No one can stand opposed to the constitution, which is the uh, the meaning, one of the meaning of rule of law. So what will be next time? Uh, so the, it concludes my um, my presentation. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. So uh, thanks um, all three of you for um, uh, your kind of, uh, for Brian for his overview and the, and the two of you for uh, discussing um, uh, your chapters. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but um, um, I know we've got, I'm pretty sure we have some audience questions as well. But let me just um, stick to a, just a couple of, uh, of things. Um, one is about um, the future of doing Hong Kong Taiwan comparison. Um, this is something that's been raised um, uh, recently with some of my students about um, whether that comparison is still uh, valid. Does the Hong Kong issue still really matter um, when we're looking at, um, at, at Taiwan? Because I think one of the things that comes out from Brian's opening remarks 
and it's come through in some of my students' research, is that things in Hong Kong have changed so much. The place has become almost unrecognisable politically compared to just um, a couple of, uh, of years ago. So that was the first question about um, whether in the future we'll still be doing Hong Kong-Taiwan comparison. Um, and the, um, um, the second um, uh, question was a way I was trying to link Jimmy and, and Xiaowei's presentations. Because uh, I was curious about, um, for, for Xiaowei's case, if you were trying to apply the framework that Jimmy was using, um, so would you kind of basically, um, uh, on a slightly different issue, do you see the courts as, as being um, fitting into that responsive um, uh, category? And, and has that um, always been the case post-transition? Because when I was listening to Jimmy's presentation, I was also thinking about change in different presidential terms. Because um, I was curious that Jimmy mentioned that after he'd done the paper, he'd kind of gone back and done even longer term uh, analysis. Yeah. And, and I was kind of thinking if, if we, let's say, take this framework back into the Li Donghui era, um, um, where we would fit that that framework um, as it, make, it was making a transition also from probably from repressive to autonomous. Um, um, uh, so there were just a few thoughts. Um, and, and let me hand over to you bef before I hand over to the, uh, the audience. Do you want, I'll go ahead and just answer. I go first. Um, yeah, so that's a great question about whether or not the Hong Kong Taiwan uh, comparative kind of context is still valid. I mean, yeah, I'd say I would struggle to make it um, mm -hmm. nowadays. I think it's becoming, you know, from everything that we've seen, and, and I think we're even struggling kind of at the end of the book. You know, to know, as I said, kind of where do we stop, you know, are and also, you know, are these comparisons may potentially getting a little bit strained uh, because of where Hong Kong was moving uh, maybe as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's much more difficult to make those Taiwan Hong Kong comparisons than before. I mean, that being said, though, I mean, you still have you know, UK judges sitting on the court of final appeal. And so you still have some of these elements uh, of kind of the Hong Kong justice system that are still there, right? So you still have, you know, some foreign judges uh, on some of these major courts and involved in some of these major trials. So, you know, people could say that that's valid, right? That that's, you know, legitimizing, you know, the Hong Kong you know justice system. I think so there's kind of two elements, I think kind of politically, maybe those elements would be really strained to make a kind of a straight comparison. But maybe if you're just looking at kind of the legal operation of things and kind of the justice system, maybe those are more manageable to make. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. It's getting really strained and I find it, you know, difficult to make that comparison nowadays. But I'd, I'd be interested to see what, you know, Jimmy and, and Xiao Wei think as well. Xiao Wei, uh... Should you go first? Okay, uh, just just a quick response to the uh, question about the constitutional court. I would say this one, uh, this one, uh, this term of the constitutional justice, they are really responsive court because um, I think they consider themselves a social reformer. Uh, um, so you, if you can observe what the decision they have made in this term. There are uh, the decriminalization of adultery. There are some about the transitional justice. Yeah. And this also the biggest one uh, are, is considered the uh, same-sex marriage. And um, when, the, uh, when the, the proposition 10 and 12 was, were uh, submitted, uh, by this uh, anti same sex camp, the um, the chief justice may release a press conference and reiterate again that the the decision of the constitutional court should be obeyed by people and also by the government. So they are very active and. Uh, uh, try to persuade people that uh, uh, you, you cannot 
it is impossible to uh, overrule or, or override the constitutional court decision just by popular voting. Thank you. Um, I, I agree. I agree with Xiao Wei that the, the current uh, term of constitutional court is quite responsive. And, uh, and my, my chapter actually brings up a, uh, an interesting dimension of studying into Taiwan's uh, judiciary because a constitutional court is definitely something very special in the whole judicial system compared to ordinary courts. And, um, and, and one thing we have to bear in mind, uh, uh, comparing the, the Xiaowei's, uh, uh, the same-sex marriage case and all the civil disobedience cases, that um, the same-sex marriage case is directly involving uh, basic rights. You know, the, there, are, there are specific people being influenced by, by such decisions. So the, it gives uh, the, the constitutional court a great legitimacy of uh, stepping in uh, and, you know, make a decision on whether to be responsible or not. But consider Sunflower Movement. It's about, you know, the future, the future of Taiwan's democracy. It's not directly concerning particular person's basic rights. So it's a very, very, very broad sweeping political controversy. And you can have very strong opinions about it. People can have very, uh, very strong opinion about it. So, so the ordinary courts, they do not have the uh, the, 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 that high of a status, you know, uh, as the constitutional court. So the ordinary court has been have been confused, and um, and they are trying, experimenting different ways of responding to this, and, and and I think it's very interesting to see how they do so. And talking about the the long term observation, I think um, um, I I will have to do more study, but from because from the decade that I looked into, it's obvious that um, before 2008, um, the Taiwan's court was in an era when they were transforming from a re being repressive to autonomous. And by doing that transformation, um, the court is growing more and more lenient on these protesters. Okay, even though they might still find them guilty. But after after Mind Zhou uh, was elected, especially the second term of Mind Zhou, uh, uh, Mind Zhou's presidency, you can see that it's very interesting because Mind Zhou's presidency has been contested by Taiwan civil society uh, to the extent that they they associate the Mind Zhou's agenda as, you know, selling Taiwan to China or it is a rev it, it is a comeback of the authoritarian KMT. These claims may be controversial and may be overblown to some extent, but that kind of association, the imaginative association, uh, gives um, um, the protesters and also a certain portion of the Taiwan's legal professionals um, uh, a very strong claim to undermine the government's, uh, you know, any kind of severe response. So the courts are motivated to, to try to find ways, not just to be lenient, but actually find ways to find them not guilty. And what's interesting is that um, it, actually, it is actually bringing pressure on, 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 on the idea of rule of law. So I have, uh, because I have been uh, invited uh, by the Supreme Court to, to offer my expert opinion on the Sunflower case, and I do see that a lot of people, especially the prosecutors, the prosecutors are very confused of what they are seeing right now because isn't it law that we have been enforcing? And isn't the law has, should, should, shouldn't the law be stable and consistent, you know, across the board and everybody enjoys the same um, access and also the same equal liberties under the law? And why do you, why do you, um, uh, civil person, uh, just, disobedience. Why do you protesters expect to be treated any different than any other lawbreakers, even though we might, we support giving you lenient sentence, but why do you find yourself so legitimate in claiming that you should be found, found not guilty? So I, I find the prosecutors very confused. So, um, so now we, have, we are in the situation of, of 
just whether we, the court, I think the court is also considering just whether we should lead the sunflower movement, consider it as an exceptional stage of uh, Taiwanese de uh, democratic development. Just leave it at that. Let's go back to normal. Or we should, you know, just normalize what they do and put it, you know, into an integral, uh, treat it as an integral part of the rule of law and, you know, make the rule of law more elastic, you know, more <laughs> responsive to, to those claims of the protesters. I think it's a very tricky situation that Taiwan's courts is facing.